From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Arizona faith leaders calling on state senators to take action against climate change and put the public's health first. Plus, Arizona State University leads in public schools with international students, but there's a significant drop in enrollment across the nation. And how creating individual county voter databases could benefit specific groups of voter populations next. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Maya Petros. And I'm Ryan Curry. Thank you for joining us. Arizona faith leaders called on Senators John McCain and Jeff Flake to battle climate change. Reporter Mia Atkins explains why leaders of Arizona's religious groups believe it's a matter of public health. I'm saying this with tears in my eyes. Please, please. You're at a point now in your careers where you're not beholden to anyone except the voters who elected you. The voters who elected you gave you a mandate. Please honor it. Faith leaders from different religions chastise Arizona senators for backing the Environmental Protection Agency's repeal of the Clean Power Plan. The Clean Power Plan was a step towards reducing carbon pollution from power plants. Arizona faith leaders said at a news conference today the move endangers people's health. And this means talking to our elected representatives about why we believe that business interests should not take priority over our health, safety, and prosperity. Senators Jeff Flake and John McCain did not respond to requests for comment, but in an earlier statement, McCain praised the EPA rollback. This onerous rule would have created millions in compliance costs for Arizona utilities, which would have been forced to pass on costs to Arizona consumers in the form of high monthly energy bills. But those improvements were expected to lower pollution from the plant. Reverend Steve Keplinger said asthma is often a result of pollution. As this continues, of course, that will include loss of, of human life. Sharfman has one message for the public and the Arizona Senators. Do not stand idly by. In Phoenix, Mia Atkins, Cronkite News. A full video of the press conference can be found on our website, cronkitenews.azpbs.org. A new allegation of sexual harassment has emerged against an Arizona state lawmaker. An employee at a risk management firm told the Arizona Capital Times that Republican Representative Don Shooter made inappropriate sexual comments and gestures toward her last August. Tara Zika joins a list of accusers that now includes nine women. She says Shooter blew her a kiss and made sexually suggestive comments about her legs at a League of Arizona Cities and Towns conference. Shooter has, has refused to comment on the allegations and was suspended Friday from leading the House of Appropriations Committee. The Arizona House of Representatives is investigating multiple accusations against Shooter. And in Congress, Speaker Paul Ryan announced today that the House of Representatives will adopt a policy to require anti-sexual harassment training for all members and staff. The Senate pushed through a similar plan last week. The policy changes come as Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore is losing support from public Republicans nationwide after allegations that he molested teenage girls four decades ago. Hate crimes are up for the second year in a row across the country. This according to a new FBI report, which says there were more than 6,000 hate crimes last year, up 5% from 2015. Here in Arizona, the FBI reported 110 hate crimes, or bias-motivated crimes, based on race, ethnicity, or ancestry, 50 based on religion, 53 based on sexual orientation, one based on disability, and none based on gender or gender identity. The vast majority of the Arizona crimes occurred in Phoenix, but Phoenix police say the number of hate crimes in the city has dropped 25% from the previous year. When an officer goes out to take an initial report on any crime that occurs in the city, one of the mandatory fields for them to investigate and report is if they detect any bias motivation. So if you look at some of the other agencies nationwide, you'll see that they have very, very few or even zero bias motivated crimes. Here in Phoenix, I think we do a much better job of identifying the crimes and investigating them properly. The Phoenix Police Department also says that having a team of detectives who only investigate these crimes may also have led to the decrease. A new report is showing a very real drop in new enrollment by international students in U.S. colleges and universities in the last academic year. Here in Arizona, the report noted a slowdown in enrollment growth. 
The annual Open Doors report by the Institute of International Education shows new enrollment for foreign students was about 290,000. That's lower than the past two years and the first drop in at least the past 10 years. In Arizona, the number of international students rose only 2% to 19,382 last year. Those enrollments were down sharply from double-digit growth in recent years. ASU leads all public universities in number of international students in the nation. It has 13,164 foreign students. That number trails only New York University, University of Southern California, Columbia, and Northeastern University. An ASU spokesman says it's seen a nearly 200% increase in international enrollment in the last 10 years. The Association of International Educators estimates that hosting international students added $686 million to the Arizona economy in the past year. For our full multimedia report on international students, go to cronkinews.azpbs.org. An investigation by the ACLU and voting rights groups claim that Arizona agencies are violating the National Voter Registration Act, a measure enacted by Congress to increase opportunities to register people to vote and simplify the process. The investigation found that the Arizona Department of Transportation didn't automatically update voter address changes. Problems in Arizona's public assistance agencies in distributing voter registration applications and extensive problems in handling of documentary proof of citizenship, which is required by Arizona law to vote in state and local elections. The investigation also found that many agencies are not providing voter registration information in Spanish or Native American languages, also required by the Voting Rights Act. The group sent their findings and demanded action in a formal letter to Arizona Secretary of State Michelle Reagan. Yesterday, Attorney General Mark Brnovich announced that city officials would have the, the ability to maintain separate voter databases. Reporter Sidney Eisenberg shows us how this could impact Arizonans. According to a 13-page opinion by Attorney General Mark Brnovich, allowing counties to maintain their own voting databases does not violate any state or federal laws. But each county would still have to submit the information they obtain to the Secretary of State's office in order for it to be entered into the statewide voter database. This includes, quote, different types of data not present on the basic voter registration form, such as individual voting history, canceled and rejected registrations, and early early and provisional ballot information. Counties would not be able to fulfill public records requests or legal subpoenas. All requests must be handled by the Secretary of State's office if Secretary of State Michelle Reagan has access to that information. Many worry that their private information could become public. President Donald Trump's Advisory Commission on Election Integrity requested states hand over their voter information this summer. Many states, including Arizona, refused. Teresa Moore an advocate for self-advocates self becoming organs. empowered says that the different voting roles could help counties identify the different voting populations in their community, particularly uh, yeah, disabled voters. Indeed. I do believe that they would have some concern about the different individuals in that community and that they would do further research if they knew that that community had a significant population. Arizona Solicitor General Dominic Dre says the information counties collect must be sent to the Secretary of State's office immediately. In Phoenix, Sydney Eisenberg, Cronkite News. We spoke with Maricopa County recorder Adrian Fontes's office. They are still analyzing Brnovich's opinion and have no comment at this time. Tonight, the Twilight Tattoo live action military pageant will honor Senator John McCain for his more than 60 years of service to the nation and the U.S. Navy. The salute to the chief will be at Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall in Virginia and will be live streamed on Facebook and Twitter. Well, months after the Burton Bar Library flood, the doors are still closed to the public. That's right, but readers can still get their hands on some of the books and materials. Coming up on Cronkite News, inside the restoration process and how you can still access some of the library's services. And riding bikes around as a mode of transportation is becoming a reality for those who don't have bikes. How this city in the valley is helping to mobilize their residents after receiving a new grant. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS 
PBS, preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. The Burton Bar Library may have had to temporarily shut down its doors due to a flood, but it won't be shutting down its books. Cronkite News reporter Bailey Moore talked with the city about its plans while the library continues its restoration process. You know, it's, it's just not the same. Yeah. It's you were, for years we were going there, for years, so. It has been about four months since Central Phoenix's Burton Bar Library closed its doors as a result of flooding, and the restoration process is still well underway. As we started to get more information as to how long that was going to take to bring that building back onto full service, we were hearing from the community, from our customers, um, the impact that its closure had on Central Phoenix. Last week, Phoenix City Council unanimously voted upon a temporary location for Burton Bar to provide its services out of until the restoration process concludes. There are a lot of people that rely on Burton Bar for, um, for respite, for um, sanctuary. Uh, people define that on their own as they come in. The temporary location will be at Phoenix's Park Central Mall and will offer many of the services that the community depends on like the music class for children. And they offer so many classes like, you know, Monday through Friday, which is amazing because we can go three times a week. They'll have the class 40 minutes and then they'll play for like another hour. So that gives them activity time. The library is passionate about being the library, Phoenix Public Library. We love what we do. We love our community. We love our customers. Um, we, we take what we provide to the community, you know, very seriously and it's very heartfelt. Um, but so in this, yes, we are looking at, well, what are some good things that can come of it? In Phoenix, Bailey Moore, Cronkite News. The Burton Bar Library is expected to reopen in June of 2018. Until then, you can visit its pop-up location at Park Central Mall. One new City of Phoenix program is helping residents ride bikes at a lower cost. Cronkite News reporter Steven Sidner visited the Edison Eastlake neighborhood to find out how this program is giving them new wheels. The Edison East Lake neighborhood is nestled in the southwest corner where I-10 bends between Sky Harbor Airport and Chase Field. Many residents there depend on public transportation. If I miss the bus, I have to sometimes call off. It takes resident Paula Gibson two hours round trip to get to work, but she and her neighbors will soon have a lower cost option to get them around downtown. The city of Phoenix plans to create a subsidized bike program. Through a partnership with the Grid Bike, uh, they're providing two stations in kind. Residents will sign up for an annual membership subsidized by the city through a grant by the Edna Foundation. Um, right now we haven't pinned down that dollar amount, but we're looking at about $5 a year. The program will also teach residents about bike safety. The Edna Foundation grant of 100000 is going to go towards mem uh, subsidized membership, uh, providing helmets, providing safety, bike safety workshops. Bernice Felix Baca also believes the program will get residents to exercise. They don't have um, options to exercise in the area. I know we're working to improve the uh, Edison Park, but in the meantime, we want to bring something sooner and faster so folks can use it to exercise and have a little fun. Gibson is encouraged by the program, but has some reservations. People work out in Tempe or Scottsdale and they can't ride the, you know, you can't ride a bike to Tempe or Scottsdale. Despite her reservations about the program, Gibson says she'll still use it to exercise. Currently, Gibson walks six miles a day. She says she will bike around the same amount once the program launches. In Phoenix, Stephen Sidner, Cronkite News. The program will launch later this month and will run for two years. The city does not expect to pay for any part of the program. Well, just a few months ago, a slew of hurricanes damaged several islands in the Caribbean and states in the south and southeast. And recovery efforts still persist after hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. How Valley Teens help the victims of these destructive storms next. Another day with our temps well above average, but we do have a cool down headed our way. Your full seven day forecast is coming up in just a few minutes.
I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. Join us each weekday at 5.30 and 10 as we bring you the top newsmakers who impact the state. We cover the stories in depth that shape and affect our local communities, and we take the time to ensure that all voices are equally heard. For more than 30 years, Arizona Horizon has been your voice and your source for what matters most, right here on Arizona PBS. News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Then join us for At Cronkite News, our weekly refresh, each Friday at 5 on Arizona PBS. The Valley is seeing abnormal amounts of flu cases this year. According to Maricopa County Public Health, there have been 150 confirmed cases since the flu season started on the 1st of October. That's a 384% increase from this time last year. So be sure to keep those hands clean and visit your doctor if you'd like to get a flu shot. Two Valley teens helped collect donations for Hurricane Harvey victims in Texas and stopped at nothing to make personal deliveries. Marcia Opong sat down with the students to learn more about their experience. They're trying to be strong for their families and stuff, but you can tell that they definitely experienced something traumatic, like losing their homes, some people losing their children, and it was very sad. I was crying. I was, uh, it was just crazy, just... They were like, oh, you know, you see it on the news and then it happens to you and it's like a whole nother thing. It's out of this world and you, you never expect it. Valley Christian High School students Lorena and Johanna Arredondo took a trip to Texas along with their mother to help out those affected by Hurricane Harvey. We collected toiletries for their houses when they get new houses, baby stuff, clothes, jackets, toys, pretty much anything that we have in our houses that we need essential for living. The teens posted on their social media accounts asking for donations and were blown away by the outpouring they received. It was amazing to see like the community come together and help out. They say those donations filled a semi-truck. Their decision to meet needs of the victims had an impact on those around them. And what I love about what Johanna and Lorena did is by their actions, they communicated a message to our fellow students, to their fellow students, you can do more and you have the ability to do that. You have the time, you have the energy, certainly have the willingness. All it takes is the effort. The five-day trip to Texas gave the students new perspective. Hold things dearly to me and the smallest things. Everything that you don't think about, basically just hold that to you because you never know when that could be taken away from you. In Chandler, Marcia Opong, Cronkite News. This isn't the last time teens will be helping people in these natural disasters. They will also be holding a fundraiser to send donations to Puerto Rico. Well, Thanksgiving is just over a week away, so when are we going to stop seeing these 80 degree temperatures? Emily Bloom is tracking the forecast for us. Emily, when can we expect some fall-like weather? I'm afraid we've got no 70s in our forecast just yet, but we do at least have a little bit of a cool down this weekend. Our high today of 88 degrees, well above that seasonal average of 76 and just a few degrees shy of that record of 91 that we set back in 1999. Across here in Phoenix at the moment, we are sitting at 84 degrees under partly cloudy skies. Across the valley, we are all sitting in those 80s with the exception of Gila Bend clocking in at 90 degrees. Across the state at the moment, we have got 66 in Sholo, 62 up at the Grand Canyon, 81 in Lake Havasu, and 88 for those of you down in Tucson. Taking a look at our future cast, we've got this area of high pressure. That is what is keeping us so warm right now. But as we head into the later part of this week, 
this trough of low pressure is going to be moving south. As that happens, it's going to push that area of high pressure even further down, and that will allow our temperatures to drop a couple of degrees. We're gonna to start to see that effect Friday. We'll be down to 83 degrees. By Saturday, we've got a high of 80, and then we've got 82 through the middle of next week. And while that's closer to where we should be, it's still above our seasonal average of 74 at this time of year. For Cronkite Weather, I'm Emily Bloom. U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions continues to defend President Donald Trump's decision to roll back an Obama-era immigration executive order known as DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Reporter Tyler Paley met a local boxer whose life could be turned upside down by the president's decision. Inside the ring, tranquility, comfort, focus. But outside a world of uncertainty and a fear of what tomorrow could hold, not just for one, but for many. I know the consequences is not just for me, it's for my entire family. You know, it's, it's for, my, for my girlfriend, for my stepson, um, for, my, for my, my, my baby that's on his way. You know, um, you know um, I feel like this is the place I can give my children the best future, just like my parents were able to give me the, um, you know, the best opportunities I could ever ask for. Alexi Sazueta arrived in the United States in 1996, brought to Arizona by his parents from Sinaloa, Mexico. The Sazuetas were undocumented, just like 325,000 other community members currently in Arizona. We will build a great wall along the southern border. Now, the Trump administration is promising to take action on undocumented immigrants. That includes so-called dreamers, or people like Alexis, who are enrolled in deferred action for childhood arrivals, known more commonly as DACA. DACA is what is called a prosecutorial discretion action. President Obama uh, took action on his own because he was frustrated that Congress could not come together to come up with a solution for children that had been brought here really when they were young and didn't know um, what was happening. Alexis arrived in Arizona when he was just one year old. I didn't even know um, much about, you know, being an illegal immigrant, you know. I saw myself the same as all my classmates. In middle school, Alexis got his first taste of what ultimately would become his life's passion. I remember one day when I was 12, I went to the swap meet with my dad. <laughs> and I saw a pair of boxing gloves. I asked him, Dad, can I, um, can I get some of those pairs of boxing gloves? I believe they were probably like $10. And he bought me two pairs so I could find my brother. <laughs> and with that, he instantly fell in love with the sport. When he first started boxing, I couldn't even look at him. I was so afraid for him. But his coach told me it was important for me to be there. I remember the first day walking in, you know, seeing the rings on the side, the boxing bags here, um, all the fighters just hitting pads, sparring. Oh, like, wow, it was like something out of a movie, you know. Uh, I used to believe that only rich kids used to <laughs> box, you know. At 17, Zazueta's amateur career was taking off. He made it past the Golden Glove State Tournament with ease. Then came the regional tournament in Las Vegas, where he represented Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Nevada. Another victory meant a bid to the national tournament. I remember training so hard for that fight. You know, waking up super early to go run, get my workout in, going home, getting ready for school. Right after school, go to the gym. Right after the gym, go to my strength and conditioning. Every day, it was like a, it was a routine. Boom, 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 for like two months. He says he was more prepared than ever for that fight, a contest that could have made Alexis Zazueta a household name in amateur boxing. But at weigh-ins, that dream came crashing down when he presented tournament officials with his boxing documentation. And they checked it and said, uh, U.S. citizen, and she had it checked off, no. U.S. citizenship was a requirement to compete in the Golden Gloves tournament, a qualification Zazueta admitted he knew going in. He was disqualified from competition, and on his way back home, he didn't talk to a single person. That's when, that's when he hit me, I mean, I have no business in this amateur's career anymore. 
you know, um, I'm ready to go pro. His first professional match was in November 2013. And in the four years since, he's undefeated at 9-0 with five knockouts. For Zazueta, it's his family that keeps him going. The 22-year-old not only has his parents and four siblings, but he's the breadwinner for a family of his own. He has an eight-year-old stepson named Daniel, and his girlfriend Paula is pregnant with their first child. It's making him more responsible because he know what he's facing, you know? I'm the head of, of my family. You know, I gotta always find a way to, just like, my, just like my dad did, find a way to succeed. I gotta do that now to my family. Zazueta says he's never been in better shape. His family is healthy and he has a baby on the way. He renewed his DACA enrollment for another two years in September. But the president's decision to roll back the program is what keeps Zazueta up at night. A classic case of an unstoppable force against an immovable object. There's always a way for anything, despite your, your uh, circumstances. There's always a way to succeed. He's gotta um, be patient and look for it. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The 13 words engraved on the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> words that inspire human beings from around the globe to sacrifice everything for the opportunity of something. And words that give dreamers like Zazueta a glimmer of hope in a world of uncertainty. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up later tonight on PBS NewsHour. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next NewsHour. How is former Trump White House advisor Steve Bannon doing in his battle against the Republican establishment? That's Tuesday on the PBS NewsHour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. For top Arizona stories at any time, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.